Throughout history, there have been inventions that changed the world as we know it. Here are the basics of how to use glass. This is the world's first self-balancing human transporter. First they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. And the good news actually is, although we look like normal people, Dimitri and I actually come to you from the future. You must know that there are multiple versions of the future, and um, there is one, for example, where the alien invasion begins in 15 minutes and the web platform essentially becomes irrelevant. But, but, but there are also good timelines. The timeline we're from is the one where there's free beer and there's web components, so it's not all bad. That future must have been in a different timeline. Because in our timeline, web components never really gain much traction. But why not? Well, to better answer that, we need to go back. First to 2010. I took little pieces of chicken and I gave it to the chicken. The iPhone had come out just three years earlier, and it was finally starting to gain mainstream adoption. Smartphone users loved the rich interactivity of mobile apps, and they began expecting that same experience from the websites they visited. At the time, the tool of choice for adding this interactive experience to the web was Flash. Created by Adobe, Flash was great because it gave you the ability to easily embed animations, audio, and interactivity into websites. The problem, ultimately, was that one man famously disagreed. And, and Flash looks like a technology that had its day, uh, but is really on, is waning. And HTML5 looks like the technology that's really on the ascendancy right now. By banning Flash on the iPhone and embracing HTML5, <laughs> Apple single-handedly put Flash in the dirt while planting the seeds for the HTML5 development platform we know and love today. That's a joke. The problem, as both Apple and later Facebook famously discovered, developers needed more than divs and form elements. And without Flash, they only had one choice, JavaScript. Initially, JavaScript was great because it allowed you to sprinkle in bits of interactivity and dynamic data into your website. But over time, as the applications we built became more complex, developers had to rely on, you guessed it, more JavaScript to manage all of that complexity. By swapping out semantic HTML for JavaScript, it made sites slower, broke assistive technologies like screen readers, and most importantly, at least for Google, made it difficult for search engines to parse and index the content. So what was the solution? So what we want to do is we want to talk to you how Web Components solves this problem. So the Web Components is this new set of technologies we created by looking at these potholes. And decided to fill them naturally as things that fit inside of the web platform as a whole. Rather than building a whole new crazy thing on the side, which all of us have done before, we decided we're going to fill those holes naturally into something that feels like just part of the web platform, just part of the standard things that you normally do in the browser, not a script and not some crazy invention that is completely brand new. The goal of Web Components was to take back the web platform by embracing HTML. They let developers add new elements to the browser without exposing their internals to the world. Instead of having to wait around for browsers to add features natively, Web Components promised the simplicity of HTML combined with the power of JavaScript. In practice, here's what that looked like. The Web Component spec was made up of three main parts, custom elements, shadow DOM, and scope styles. Custom elements allowed you to create new HTML elements by extending HTML itself. This allowed developers to combine markup, styles, and behavior into a reusable package that the browser would treat the same way as native HTML elements. Next was the Shadow DOM. Now remember, at this point in time, jQuery and its embrace of selectors and imperative DOM manipulation was the most popular way to build web apps. The problem, among others, was that a script could run a query and make updates to anything on the page. This meant that small changes to the internal structure of a UI element could break the entire app. And this is what the Shadow DOM aimed to solve. The Shadow DOM let developers hide the internal markup of a component from other scripts. By creating a new shadow root, the result of this build UI function is now hidden from the rest of the document, and therefore no random query can access or modify it. And finally, by adding the scoped attribute, scope styles allowed you to avoid styling conflicts by scoping styles to a block of HTML. Honestly, that all seems pretty nice. So what happened? Well, first, it took forever. The first version of the spec shipped in 2013, two years after they were first announced. It was another three years full of debates and breaking changes before the standard was widely adopted by other browser vendors as well. That code we just looked at, it's all different now. Scope CSS was never even standardized and it's already been removed from most browsers. As for custom elements and Shadow DOM, well, were those better than any of the newer frameworks that were created since we first learned about web components back in 2011? Adoption graphs say no. Conspicuously missing from all of the early demos for web components, was how you actually built the internal UI for the component. You know, the rest of the owl. That brings us nicely to the next problem. Authoring web components is a nightmare. 
so much so that they literally warn you about this on the opening line of their website to this day. Here's an example of one. It's a quantity dropdown which updates the price when you change it. The details here aren't particularly important, but how this code makes you feel is. A whole page of that? Yeah. Your brain doesn't know it, Damn. but your heart can tell. Your heart goes, it's not working. Writing low-level DOM was so painful that Google created a JavaScript framework called Polymer, whose entire goal was to make it easier and faster to make custom elements. The solution browser vendors came up with to eliminate the need for frameworks was too difficult to use without a framework. That brings us to the final point. Web components are fine in all the ways that don't matter. The real challenge in building interactive UIs isn't just building components. It's managing the flow of data throughout the entire application. Of all of the problems that web components set out to solve, they missed the most important one. There was actually an early proposal for the Chrome team called Model Driven Views that added a backbone style observable to the browser. But apparently, no one could agree on how it should be implemented, and it never made it through the standardization process. In the meantime, developers at Facebook released React, a deeply pragmatic solution that offered developers an easier way to build components and a more intuitive way to manage state. It's no wonder that React was so hated when it first came out. It was everything that the platform was against, a framework where everything was written in JavaScript. But by rethinking the best practices of the time, React was able to solve real problems for real developers who were building real applications. By the time that web components finally standardized in 2016, it was too late. React had created a tectonic shift in web development, and web components were perfectly suited for a world that no longer existed. You stand there, it goes. Forward and backward? It's sort of like putting on a pair of magic sneakers.